Good evening, workshoppers. Here we go. We're up to episode 188. And as I was going through and talking with some of the people, you know, in the uh, the, the pre-show, we're going to hit episode 200 by the end of the year. And it's kind of like one of those uh, first times I'm realizing it. And it's kind of exciting. It's uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff, you know, going on for this uh, this year in particular. We've got, of course, you know, uh, new development update coming up soon. Diablo Immortal testing going through coming up soon. There's a uh, you know there, there's some good, but there's also of course there's uh, some bad uh, that's been going around. We of course you know I've talked about it on the show quite a bit these last couple of months because you know COVID nineteen is pretty much going and affecting everybody, uh, and you know it shouldn't really have to be said, but it needs to be said. And I'm a, a firm supporter of Black Lives Matter. And I know the vast majority of people that listen to the show aren't actually within the U.S. So bear with me for just a little bit uh, as I go through and talk about some American politics. But uh, here in the U.S., the, we've been having uh, quite a bit of social unrest these last couple of weeks. And it's really been saddening going through and seeing it and that, you know, people going and saying that, you know, a whole demographic, a whole major group within the U.S. has to go and protest on the streets to say that their lives are worth just as much as everybody else in being, you know, beaten back uh, just trying to say that and just trying to get that recognition to me is just sickening. And even here in my own little hometown where I don't ever even remember like protests and even when you know, uh, Trump was elected and first came to Mar-a-Lago. Sure, there were people that would uh, stand on the sides of Southern with signs and stuff, but you didn't have any, like, real big protests. And here, within the last two weeks, we've had a couple of major protests in my hometown where they've had to close off streets, block off parts of I-95. And for the most part, it's all been peaceful, except for the first night where there was peaceful protests going on, and then at around 9.15, the cops announced a 9 o'clock curfew. They gave the, the protesters zero chance to disperse and immediately opened up with pepper bullets. You know, after saying that you're in curfew violation of a curfew that didn't exist. They weren't told about it. And, of course, then violence escalated. Some, you know, shops were damaged and some cars were set on fire. But these things were, that happened were due to escalation. Everything was peaceful up until the point that things happened that they're protesting against, the police brutality and all those other types of stuff. And it's just, it's mind-blowing to me that this is even like a political conversation that's taking place. And, you know, to be silent about these issues is to allow them to continue to happen. And I thank you for going through and bearing with me here for just a little bit at the beginning of the show. I really hate going through and being political. I hate talking about politics on Twitter, but it's just, it's been so bad here in the US that it, you know, things have to be said. And anybody that has a platform, you know, I, I think should use it for good. And these are the things that I believe in. You know, nothing's changing about the show. Nothing's changing about me. These are, uh, you know, thoughts and feelings that I've always had. It's just, it feels as if it's gotten to a point where those, those opinions have to be made um and again thank you for going through and bearing with me and you know here on episode 188 of uh, season 20 on the way out to you know go back from world politics a little bit and to get into some diablo news um you know since uh, the recording of the last episode we've had the new uh patch 2.6.9 ptr update it had some uh interesting changes in it but nothing like too um, to major, to uh, game breaking, uh, it's you know they they address some concerns that the community was having with uh, the playability of the uh, Demon Hunter set, so they they made it uh, work uh, as we originally kind of hoped that it had uh, been intended. It was the the first iteration of the Gears of the Dreadlands set forced you to. Um, strafe and then stop and then build up momentum stacks and then strafe and then stop and strafe and stop and it was very uh uh janky it, it didn't feel you know all that good or all that smooth and so now they've went through and they've made some uh fundamental changes to the way that the set worked 
to where now the uh, the bonus for the momentum stacks will now uh, last up to a maximum of 20 seconds, as well as you'll continue to build stacks while you're strafing, so you won't actually have to you know you drop out of it. Um, it's a it's a very fast set. If you've gone through and you've been watching some of the people that have been streaming the PTR, like SVR, Bloodshed, and others, uh, it, it's really fast. It seems that it's going to be like a really kick-ass uh, T16 like clearing set. Probably is a little bit behind the uh, the absolute maximum that like say a multi-shot demon hunter is, uh, but it is it's just going to be ridiculously fast at going through and doing those clears. Uh, you know some of the uh, some other you know thoughts and feelings that are out there um you know it might be it might be usable in say kind of like a, a pseudo rat run scenario uh but it still is missing a little bit when it comes to like the the high end like uh, gr pushes we'll have to see if there's any other changes between the end of the ptr and when the patch itself goes live the last couple of seasons they've always gone back in and they've made a couple of little tweaks in between the uh the actual ptr ending in the patch that have helped to try and address some of those concerns. Uh, the uh, the other big change uh, that occurred was just to the um, like the the seasonal uh, the seasonal bonus. They're they're dropping it down to ninety seconds instead of two minutes. Uh, but you know I guess that they're right now a little bit um, concerned you know with that season nineteen repeat like I was talking about in like the previous episode, and it doesn't feel. Uh, very impactful like at all you like barely notice you're not going to try and pull packs you know together in order to try and get uh, wait for that 90 second proc uh, in order to like, go through and like finish finish off packs or kill packs so it is uh it's uh, you know just it's going to be a, a nice bonus is, is probably the best way of you know saying it but not really something at the moment that you're going to be you know basing your entire uh, rift clear around which you know, there, there's some positives and negatives that I, I laid out in the, the last episode. You want it to be impactful so that way it makes this season unique and that you're actually kind of changing your playstyle. But you you don't want, you know, angels killing rift bosses. We'll, we'll, we'll see if they're able to tweak those numbers, you know, to bring them a little bit more in line with making the season be impactful but not game-breaking. Uh, and then finally, it was just some light little quality of life updates to the new Necromancer set. So that way, when you're running the, the Masquerade or the Burning Carnival or the Haunted Visions neck piece, Simulacrums uh, will now, uh, they'll rubber band to the Necromancer. Uh, so that way, if they get, uh, if they're uh, falling a little bit too far behind, they'll just instantly teleport to you. That was one of the big issues with the uh, the Necromancer set, was that your, your Simulacrums would kind of, get stuck wherever they were because as you were moving in casting spells they were staying in the same place kind of being locked into casting those spells and it would take a while for them to finally make their way up to you to kill the things that you you wanted them to kill um but the uh the the damage for the set unfortunately kind of like the demon hunter set isn't really quite there and so while some people were hoping to see some other buffs uh to the set for this uh this round of the ptr it uh it didn't happen and that was actually kind of a, a little bit of a head scratcher because, you know, again, you know, while it's like kind of nice for like some doing some stuff or like on, you know, T16, like regular riffs, trying to take it into greater riffs, it doesn't really have a place. You know, it, it, the, it definitely, you know, pales in comparison to uh, like some of the new Corpse Explosion Necromancer builds as far as like speed runs go or even just high end clears. And so it's kind of like, you know, what do you want this to do? Where do you want it to go in? You know, most of the sets have been successful in changing things up for the, the, the classes, uh, but it looks like it might be uh, another uh, Typhon's Veil. Uh, you know, it might be following the, uh, the the way of the wizard, where it's a nice little fun set to go and play around with, but it is not going to be really changing things up too much, you know, for, for the class in general. But, you know, again, there, there's still time for them to go through and make changes outside of the PTR, you know, while we await and see, you know, what what else that they might have planned. And speaking of the end of the uh, the, the PTR, in the end of season twenty, uh, we now have confirmed. Uh, Diablo has went through and posted on Twitter uh, that uh, the uh, season twenty will be ending on June twenty first. So we have, uh, as of the recording, about another week and a half 
uh, of season 20. So make sure that you go through, you get any of your uh, season goals in, you know, try and uh, make that final push for Guardian if you haven't already, just so that way you can get the, the nice portrait and seasonal pet, um, you know, and, you know, go through and get ready, you know, for the, uh, the next patch in season 21. They haven't yet announced when season 21 itself is going to start. Uh, but they have made a commitment, at least, that they they no longer like doing the one-week period where they end the season on a Sunday and then start it on the very next Friday, where we only have those you know four or five days in between the end of one season and the start of the next one. Uh, the one issue that kind of arises on this one, and I noticed like, Dread Scythe was talking about it on Twitter, was that if they follow the method that they did for Season 20 in for Season 19, uh, would mean that you know, you probably would have the uh, the patch itself dropping on the 30th or the 23rd, but then the season itself would be starting on July 3rd, which of course here in the U.S. July 4th is a you know a major holiday. A lot of businesses and things like that will actually be closed on that Friday. I wouldn't be surprised if at Blizzard a lot of people are going through and taking you know a, a longer weekend on that particular uh, time frame. So this one might be weird in the respect that we might actually have three weeks in between a season end and a season start. If they don't start it on July 3rd, I highly doubt that they're going to be going and wanting to push it up to start it on uh, June 26th, which means that they might be pushing it back all the way to July 10th. Uh, you know, we'll still probably not get a confirmation of when the patch will launch or when the season will start until we're closer to the end date. So I wouldn't really expect anything for at least another week or two before we have more information on when this new season itself is going to be starting. Uh, but it is something to go and keep an eye out for uh, and also to just kind of make plans for. We might actually have three weeks in between uh, this season uh, in the next. Uh, I, I am, you know, going through looking forward to it. Uh, if obviously, even though it's not uh, all that game-changing, that new Necromancer set looks like a lot of fun. I was watching a couple of Lord Fluffy's streams as he was going and testing it out. The, uh, his uh, teeth build that he's actually had over on Diablo fans for quite some time now. Uh, you know, he it was, I want to say that he went through and he made that one like right after the, the Necromancer was re released. And he's constantly been updating it, too. Uh, now kind of has a home. And so it's this uh, that uh, teeth uh, bone spear build that he has actually fits really well uh, with the new Necromancer set. I'll be interested in going through, trying it out, messing around with it a little bit. Uh, and it also gives a little bit of hope that maybe with Season 22, uh, they'll change up the uh, Hadrix gift bonuses and we'll actually get like all of those new sets in. Or maybe they won't do all of them at once and they'll shift, you know, the... Um, They'll, they'll shift it around so that way each uh, each set yeah, has uh, or each class has a different set uh, as opposed to what it had been in uh, previous seasons. It's still nice to have a set rotation, but maybe give it a little bit of, of flexibility there. Um, and then you know as uh, uh, Watson was actually going through and talking about a little bit in the uh, the, the pre-show for the uh, the show. Uh, the uh, we only have a, at least a maximum of three more weeks to wait until the uh, developer blog for Diablo 4 comes up. I'm, I'm hoping that we won't have to wait the the absolute maximum, and they're gonna go through and like drop that on June 30th, which is a Tuesday. Uh, hopefully, we'll we'll get it a little bit beforehand. And I was going and checking out IGN Summer of Gaming, which uh, started officially today, June 10th. Uh, but it, with the schedule that they have posted, while it still confirms that Blizzard is going to be a part of it, uh, nowhere on the schedule does it actually say uh, when Blizzard is taking part in it. Uh, so hopefully it's just like one of those ones they haven't picked a date or anything like that. There are a couple of events that they have um, scheduled on there that don't have a publisher or developer tied to it. But these kind of exclusive announcements uh, seem to be like exclusive uh, like debut or in, uh, stuff like that, like brand new game, you know. And so I, I don't think that that really is going to fall under anything uh, when it comes to Diablo, uh, just because it's it's not a new game, you know. It's something that's already out there. It's already known. Uh, the only exception would potentially be is if it's going to be something Immortal related and they just want to have it as a surprise because if you go through and you start publishing, oh yeah, we're going to talk about Diablo Immortal, uh, the, the trolls are going to go through and come out. 
Uh, and also, of course, speaking about Diablo Immortal, uh, very shortly we should be having that regional testing because they did say mid year. We're you know now officially at mid year. It's June. Uh, you know, so within the next month or two, we, we hope that we'll actually begin to see some regional testing for Immortal. Uh, and, you know, uh, it was a question that was posed to me uh, by, uh, you know, a friend. You know, what if they have an NDA with the, uh, the regional testing? And it was like, you know, I, I don't think that they would. That doesn't really seem like something that Blizzard's ever done. Even for, like, their alpha tests and such, there's no NDA. You know, you know if you're in any of their alpha testing... You're, you're free to go through and stream it. They've never really held that stuff back. But with Immortal, it is, of course, it's, it's different. It's, you know, being, you know, published alongside, you know, NetEase. They're, they're co-developing it. So 100% of creative control isn't uh, at Blizzard. It's something that they might want to go through and hold off. But also just because of the, the negative press associated around uh, Diablo Immortal might have them hold back, you know, on that testing and that you know they'll they'll have the they'll send it out they'll get testing they'll get feedback and all the other types of stuff they don't want any gameplay or anything like that to be shown uh you know just to uh not not feed the trolls more or less you know i don't want to say critics because you know they're they're not really uh most of the people that you know are voicing opinions still about immortal making phone jokes is not criticism that's that's just trolling uh and you know, I'm I'm definitely in the uh, the vein of people that's excited for Immortal. You know, that probably shouldn't come as a shock to anybody. Uh, that you know, I'm I really am looking forward to it. I, I do hope that the uh, the the pricing uh, structure and the monetization structure of the game uh, works for me because I, I don't want to have a whole ton of lore and story locked behind like sort of somewhat of a, a paywall. Uh, and that of course is like the the biggest question on a lot of people's minds. Uh, and, you know, I've actually been doing a, a series uh, with uh, Echo Gaming on Diablo Immortal. Uh, he has uh, created a little YouTube channel uh, called uh, Echo Diablo. And it is something that he's been doing a ton of videos leading up to uh, Immortal's launch. And so it's something that I am uh, I'm really interested in. I, I'm looking forward to. Um, you know what uh, what uh, you know Diablo Immortal has or what they have to offer and so it's something that um, I'm pretty excited about and I'm uh, also happy that you know he decided to go through and reach out to me and so Echo and I have been doing a series of videos on uh, Diablo Immortal lore right now we're just at the beginning and so there's a lot of people that are excited about Immortal that make that might not have never played a uh, Diablo game in the past and so we're kind of doing an introduction you know, to the series and doing kind of like a really quick run through of the entire history of everything. Uh, and so I mean like a really quick run through uh, because the, the central component about Immortal is you're going and hunting down, you know, corrupted shards of the World Stone. But what the hell is the World Stone? Even a lot of people that have played every single Diablo game that's out there, it's still kind of like World Stone. That's that thing that Tyrael blew up, right? Yeah. And in the video games... That's about all that you know about the World Stone. They've they've not said anything about it. They've not you know done background or history or anything like that. It got a little bit of a, a lip service mentioning you know in Diablo three at the end where Malthiel just says, oh yeah, all human souls go to where the World Stone once resided. And that was it. You know that's that pretty much talks about the entirety of everything we know about the World Stone coming from just the games, and even then. Going back through like the Sin War trilogy and the, the Books of Cain, the Books of Tyrael and such, there isn't really all that much more about the World Stone. It's just things that you have to kind of um, uh, look at and infer, you know, some things from the World Stone about, you know, what it at what points it's involved with and who's able to beat who and, you know, well, why don't, you know, Bale, Mephisto, and Diablo just like break into Sanctuary and kick Anarius' ass, like... He's he's not even an archangel, you know. It's like he's not in the he's not in the Angiris Council. Like he's he's just an angel. The three of them could kick his ass easily, you because know, it doesn't even really talk about that so much in the Sin War trilogy itself. But it's like, yeah, he, he's got the World Stone. He could just easily just like snap his fingers and poof, you know, gone, banished, get out of here, you know. And that's just uh, you know some of the things that you have to you have to kind of like pick up on and look at, you know. It's just that, yeah. Anarius, he's, he's just, he's, you know, he's just an everyday angel that I guess, you know, has, uh, 
you know, uh, access to like, you know, thermonuclear warheads that could, you know, completely obliterate all of existence type thing. So yeah, maybe, maybe we'll just go through and leave him alone. Because as soon as, as soon as Eldisian takes the world stone from him, yeah, then, you know, then he's just an average Joe. He's locked up in chains and given over to hell. To, oh yeah, just go ahead, torture him until the end of existence. That's fine. We don't care. Uh, which of course, Diablo 4, we know Lilith's in there and nowhere in any of the stories or the lore or the background um, has Lilith ever been mentioned in Diablo without Anarius being mentioned alongside her. Anarius has been mentioned by himself quite a bit uh, back in Diablo 1. You know, there was a, a there was it, Anarius was originally introduced in Diablo one. You know, it's like oh he was he was captured by Mephisto and you know he was like the angel of vanity and you know he's locked in a prison of mirrors while all these hooks stretch out his form and like from that essence you know the the the, crea the creators of the uh, um, what is it not the uh, it wasn't the butcher but the the blacksmith you know the um, the, the blacksmith you know so the guy that. Uh, was in the, uh, the the barracks in Diablo 2 as well as the uh, the River of Flame uh, in uh, Act 4. Um, that they were super they were apparently they were angels or followers of Anarius that were given the same type of torture that Anarius was. And you know and then I guess Lilith did have like a little bit of a, a casual mention in Diablo 2 because of the. Uh, uh, the Hellfire Charm, so the Uber Tristram, you had to go through and kill her, but at the time she was referred to as the Mother of Andariel. So her ch her story got changed quite a bit. Um, and of course, you know, Anarius' story was changed a little bit. In the Sin War trilogy, he was still very vain. Um, but, you know, angels no longer had flesh in order to, you know, uh, pull out or distort. Uh, but, you know, ever ever since that change, it, it's been Anarius and Lilith have always been mentioned together. They're you know, two peas in a pod. They're two sides of the same coin type thing. So it, with Diablo 4 having a super big focus on Lilith, uh, without a doubt, 100% without a doubt, I will make, I will make this, I will, I will bet you know, 100,000 internet money dollars, Anarius is going to be in Diablo 4. Um, and it's not going to be like a minor part. It, it, it's going to, it, he's going to be central to the story somehow. He just has to be. I mean, he's, he's even has like the little cameo in the opening sequence. So it is kind of a, it is kind of like a, a cop out prediction. I do realize that, that it's like, yeah, he's in the opening cinematic. Of course he's going to be in the game. Um, but it is, it's one of those ones where it's, um, you know, it, it's just uh, as big as Lilith is going to be to the story. I'm pretty sure Narius is going to go through and fit in there somewhere. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's my prediction for it. And it sucks, you know, going and trying to make predictions or talk about, you know, what what could be or what could happen when it comes to Diablo 4 or even Diablo Immortal, because the story is always the last thing that they talk about. You know, you really don't, you get like little tidbits, like little pieces here and there, but that's always the thing that they leave until the end. You know, they want you to be surprised, you know, um, and so when that is like your focal point, the thing that you want to, to go and look into yeah, you know, it's it sucks. And even going into the beta, it was actually a conversation that was going on on Leviathan stream where they were talking about, you know, could we have the uh, debacle in testing Diablo four like there was for Diablo three, where you only had twelve levels and you're allowed to go all the way up until the point where you killed the skeleton king, and that was it. You couldn't test any of the systems in the game. You could you you could only test like a fraction of the skills and the skill runes, and you never got to see like the end game. Or test, you know, it's like, is Inferno properly balanced? You know, or the legendary system, is that good? You know, things of that nature. Zero testing. Zero testing. And of course, once the game went live, it was all pretty bad. You know, that was, it was, it was definitely a lot to, uh, a lot to be desired. Um, you know, would Diablo 4 suffer the same fate? And of course, I, I want to say they learned their lesson. They're, they're not going to go through and do something like that, especially when we go and we look at, uh, Reaper of Souls, the whole game was open, so you could go and test out everything, you just couldn't kill Malthiel. You know, so the, the final boss fight and the ending of the game were at least left hidden. Uh, Diablo 4, I think, can actually even take that even further uh, with the fact that because it's an open world uh, and it's free to go through and explore, 
uh, you can more or less remove the entirety of the story from the game. Uh, you just have an open world with dungeons, and it's just like, yeah, go out, kill things, get experience, get levels, you know, just full-on adventure mode type stuff. Um, and then, you know, go into the end game, test the end game dungeons, all those other types of things, and have zero story. So that way, when people go and play it for the first time, and actually, you know, they have to go through the story, it's new. It's surprising. Uh, of course, you know, it, it, to me, it means I have to wait even longer, you know, before I get that, that content that I want. Uh, but it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's going to have like that really big, that really big payoff because then at that point, you know, if you've been playing the beta or at least keeping up with the beta, um, you should have an idea of how the game plays. So there's not really going to be anything, uh, too surprising. You're not trying to like learn mechanics. You can you know, play through the game and just like really sit there and focus in on the story, you know, from the get go. And that at least I kind of, you know, appreciate uh, when thinking about it from that point of view, that I can just sit there. Because when I was playing Diablo 3, it was kind of like, ooh, I gotta stop and, you know, ch what's these new skills? And I, I unlocked a new passive slot, so which one's gonna be better? You know, it's, uh, I'm having to go and look at all these different stuff, and, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. No one had any idea what they were doing, because no one got past level 12, you know, uh, and when Diablo 3 first launched. Uh, and so it was just kind of like, I'm having to stop here, but, oh man, I really want to get to the next quest. I want to... I want to find out who Belial is, you know, type thing, because we couldn't figure it out that it was the little emperor, child emperor thing the entire time. That was such a shocking revelation. Or for Asmodan to go through and say, oh, you'll never beat this next boss. Yeah, right. Um, but it, it was at least a, a difference with going and playing Reaper of Souls uh, that, you know, even though I had already played through the story, I could at least kind of slow roll it to see if there's any extra bits that they had added in between the beta and live. There wasn't, but at least it was, you know, being able to like, go and like check things out. I knew, I knew what stats were good. I knew, you know, I knew what item bonuses to look for or what legendaries were going to be decent because I, you know, had, you know, played the beta. And I, I hope for a similar experience like that with Diablo 4. And so that way I can actually kind of take a little bit more time and slow roll the story and such. And if anybody, you know, wants to go through and you know, watch that story with me, you know, should I go through and still be streaming uh, once the game finally comes out within the next two years, three years, next five years? No, wouldn't be that long, would it? Um, but it is, uh, it's, I'll, I'll definitely have a, a fun playthrough of the story, you know, uh, here on Twitch once it's uh, obviously available. Um but yeah, that's uh, that's my hopes uh, of uh, what's going through and coming up, and then then of course I have you know similar expectations when it goes through and comes to Diablo Immortal. Diablo Immortal, I think, is going to be one of those ones where since it's more of an MMO than what Diablo Four is, we'll have that opportunity to take a little bit more time and focus in on the story of uh, areas. It's also we we just are gonna it's gonna fill in pieces uh, because like uh, in Diablo Three, it takes pay, it takes place twenty years uh, after Diablo Two. But it doesn't, the game itself doesn't really answer any questions or fill in any gaps. Uh, the only thing that the game really goes through and tells you is that, oh, the necromancer from Diablo 2 uh, lived because he, he has apprentices. And then once you play, once Reaper of Souls came out, you know, it, oh, so the sorceress died. But it doesn't really give you any information about how she died. That was done in a short story that exists outside of the game. We, you know, I think more people might care a little bit more if you put those stories inside the game. Obviously, you have that ability, you know, to opt out of the cutscene or to skip the dialogue for those people that just want to, you know, push through and, you know, click through the game, which is, you know, admittedly the majority of people playing. But I think that there's a non insignificant number of people that play the game that want, you know, more of that, you know, to be in the game itself, you know, because that's obviously, I love the story of, of, uh, in the lore of Diablo. But I also like the games too, uh, and it kind of sucks, you know, from the, the viewpoint that in order to enjoy the lore of Diablo, I can't be playing Diablo. And if I want to learn the story of Lilith and Inarius, I have to read a trilogy of books, you know. Um, I want to know about the creation of Sanctuary, I've got to read the Book of Cain, you know. I want to know more about, uh, you know, how the, the, the coven works or interacts, i got to you got to read the book of, uh, you know, uh, Adria. So there's a lot of things that it's like you've got to go outside uh, the game and you can't just appreciate it from within the context of the game itself. Now, 
that is of course a little bit more of like a an mmo thing than an arpg thing but it is something that i think at least with a, an open world uh, uh arpg or like a mmo arpg that diablo immortal is that they'll hopefully be able to weave those storytelling elements a little bit uh, into the game a little bit better. Because like, uh, imagine of having all of those various lore entries from the Book of Cain, the Book of Tyrael, and the Book of Adria, you know, voiced, you know, by you know Michael Go himself, the voice of Deckard Cain, actually voicing all of those entries. You know, that that would be uh, pretty awesome. You know, having the the whole like a book done as an audio book voiced by him would be amazing. Uh, and those are those are little things that I would thoroughly enjoy, like little uh, tidbits in there. Um, so th those are my expectations. And again, sorry, this is the second time in the episode I'm going through and ranting about uh, uh, you know, different topics and such. Uh, but uh, again, I, I thank you for going through, staying with me here for this episode. Um, I'm really going and looking forward to what the next couple of weeks have. We got some very exciting times for Diablo players. Not just the new season. We should, uh, by the time that the next episode rolls around, we're also should have a little bit better of an idea of when we're going to be going through and get that developer uh, update for D4. Uh, and who knows? We might have a little bit more information about uh, what's coming for the future of Diablo during the IGN Summer of Gaming. Is that Diablo 2 uh, remake rumor true? You know, is it uh, is it uh, another uh, you know a little uh, little uh, false indication of things that are coming out? We don't know. Uh, but again, you know, thank you for going through and listening to me here on the show. Uh, if you if you like the show or you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please drop me an email at westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com, and you can check the show out uh, live on twitch.tv slash blizzpro every other Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can follow the show at the WM Workshop at Twitter, or you can follow myself at NineBallGamer on Twitter. Uh, and be sure to go through and check out Diablo.BlizzPro.com you know, for all your information regarding uh, you know, Diablo. Uh, we are also, you can find us in-game for the BlizzPro clan. There's also the Westmark Workshop community. Uh, and then, of course, uh, be sure to go through and check out the lore series that I'm doing uh, with Echo Gaming um, over at Echo Gaming Diablo on YouTube. And you can always find me uh, I should be starting up a, a new lore series on Diablo fans here within the next couple of weeks. And so with that, I bid you all a good night, and I'll catch you all next time.